Chapter Two of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. First Lessons in the Art of Instruction. As we drove along, my spirits revived again, and I turned with pleasure to the contemplation of the new life upon which I was entering. But though it was not far past the middle of September, the heavy clouds and strong northeasterly wind combined to render the day extremely cold and dreary, and the journey seemed a very long one, for as Smith observed, the roads were very heavy, and certainly his horse was very heavy too. It crawled up the hills and crept down them, and only condescended to shake its sides in a trot where the road was at a dead level or a very gentle slope, which was rarely the case in those rugged regions so that it was nearly one o'clock before we reached the place of our destination. Yet after all, when we entered the lofty iron gateway, when we drove softly up the smooth, well-rolled carriage road, with the green lawn on each side, studded with young trees, and approached the new but stately mansion of Wellwood, rising above its mushroom poplar groves, my heart failed me, and I wished it were a mile or two farther off. For the first time in my life I must stand alone. There was no retreating now. I must enter that house and introduce myself among its strange inhabitants. But how was it to be done? True, I was near nineteen, but thanks to my retired life and the protecting care of my mother and sister, I well knew that many a girl of fifteen or under was gifted with a more womanly address and greater ease and self-possession than I was. Yet if Mrs. Bloomfield were a kind, motherly woman, I might do very well after all. And the children, of course, I should be at ease with them. And Mr. Bloomfield, I hoped, I should have but little to do with. Be calm, be calm whatever happens, I said within myself. And truly I kept this resolution so well, and was so fully occupied in steadying my nerves and stifling the rebellious flutter of my heart, that when I was admitted into the hall and ushered into the presence of Mrs. Bloomfield, I almost forgot to answer her polite salutation, and it afterwards struck me that the little I did say was spoken in the tone of one half dead or half asleep. The lady, too, was somewhat chilly in her manner, as I discovered when I had time to reflect. She was a tall, spare, stately woman, with thick black hair, cold grey eyes, and extremely sallow complexion. With due politeness, however, she showed me my bedroom, and left me there to take a little refreshment. I was somewhat dismayed at my appearance on looking in the glass. The cold wind had swelled and reddened my hands, uncurled and untangled my hair, and dyed my face of a pale purple. Add to this that my collar was horridly crumpled, my frock splashed with mud, my feet clad in stout new boots, and as the trunks were not brought up, there was no remedy. So having smoothed my hair as well as I could, and repeatedly twitched my obdurate collar, I proceeded to clomp down the two flights of stairs, philosophizing as I went, and with some difficulty found my way into the room where Mrs. Bloomfield awaited me. She led me into the dining-room, where the family luncheon had been laid out. Some beefsteaks and half-cold potatoes were set before me, and while I dined upon these she sat opposite, watching me, as I thought and endeavouring to sustain something like a conversation, consisting chiefly of a succession of commonplace remarks, expressed with frigid formality. But this might be more my fault than hers, for I really could not converse. In fact, my attention was almost wholly absorbed in my dinner, not from ravenous appetite, but from distress at the toughness of the beefsteaks and the numbness of my hands, almost palsied by their five hours' exposure to the bitter wind. I would gladly have eaten the potatoes and left the meat alone, but having got a large piece of the latter on my plate, I could not be so impolite as to leave it. So after many awkward and unsuccessful attempts to cut it with a knife, or tear it with a fork, or pull it asunder between them, sensible that the awful lady was a spectator to the whole transaction, I at last desperately grasped the knife and fork between my fists, like a child of two years old, and fell to work with all the little strength I possessed. But this needed some apology. With a feeble attempt at a laugh, I said, 
my hands are so benumbed with the cold that i can scarcely handle my knife and fork i dare say you would find it cold replied she with a cool immutable gravity that did not serve to reassure me when the ceremony was concluded she led me into the sitting-room again where she rang and sent for the children you will find them not very far advanced in their attainments she said for i have so little time to attend to their education myself and we have thought them too young for a governess till now but i think they are clever children and very apt to learn especially the little boy he is i think the flower of the flock a generous noble-spirited boy one to be led but not driven and remarkable for always speaking the truth he seems to scorn deception this was good news his sister marianne will require watching continued she but she is a very good girl upon the whole though i wish her to be kept out of the nursery as much as possible as she is now almost six years old and might acquire bad habits from the nurses i have ordered her crib to be placed in your room and if you will be so kind as to overlook her washing and dressing and take charge of her clothes she will need have nothing further to do with the nursery maid i replied that i was quite willing to do so and at that moment my young pupils entered the apartment with their two younger sisters master tom bloomfield was a well-grown boy of seven with a somewhat wiry frame flaxen hair blue eyes small turned-up nose and fair complexion marianne was a tall girl too somewhat dark like her mother but with a round full face and high colour in her cheeks the second sister was fanny a very pretty little girl mrs bloomfield assured me that she was a remarkably gentle child and required encouragement but she had not learned anything yet but in a few days she would be four years old and then she might take her first lesson in the alphabet and be promoted to the schoolroom the remaining one was harriet a little broad fat merry playful thing of scarcely two that i coveted more than all the rest but with her i had nothing to do i talked to my little pupils as well as i could and tried to render myself agreeable but with little success i fear for their mother's presence kept me under an unpleasant restraint they however were remarkably free from shyness they seemed bold likely children and i hoped i should soon be on friendly terms with them the little boy especially of whom i had heard such a favourable character from his mamma in marianne there was a certain affected simper and a craving for notice that i was sorry to observe but her brother claimed all my attention to himself he stood bolt upright between me and the fire with his hands behind his back talking away like an orator occasionally interrupting his discourse with a sharp reproof to his sisters when they made too much noise oh tom what a darling you are exclaimed his mother come and kiss dear mamma and then won't you show miss gray your schoolroom and your nice new books i won't kiss you mamma but i will show miss gray my schoolroom and my new books and my schoolroom and my new books tom said marianne they're mine too they're mine he replied decisively come along miss gray i'll escort you when the room and books had been shown with some bickerings between the brother and sister that i did my utmost to appease or mitigate marianne brought me her doll and began to be very loquacious on the subject of its fine clothes its bed its chest of drawers and other appurtenances but tom told her to hold her clamour that miss gray might see his rocking-horse which with a most important bustle he dragged forth from its corner into the middle of the room loudly calling on me to attend to it then ordering his sister to hold the reins he mounted and made me stand for ten minutes watching how manfully he used his whip and spurs meantime however i admired marianne's pretty doll and all its possessions and then told master tom he was a capable rider but i hoped he would not use his whip and spurs so much when he rode a real pony oh yes i will he said laying on with redoubled ardour i'll cut into him like smoke eh my word but he shall sweat for it this was very shocking but i hoped in time to be able to work a reformation now you must put on your bonnet and shawl said the little hero and i'll show you my garden 
and mine said marianne tom lifted his fist with a menacing gesture she uttered a loud shrill scream ran to the other side of me and made a face at him surely tom you would not strike your sister i hope i shall never see you do that i'm obliged to do it now and then to keep her in order but it is not your business to keep her in order you know that is for well now go and put on your bonnet i don't know it is so very cloudy and cold it seems likely to rain and you know i have had a long drive no matter you must come i shall allow of no excuses replied the consequential little gentleman and as it was the first day of our acquaintance i thought i might as well indulge him it was too cold for marianne to venture so she stayed with her mamma to the great relief of her brother who liked to have me all to himself the garden was a large one and tastefully laid out besides several splendid delilahs there were some other fine flowers still in bloom but my companion would not give me time to examine them i must go with him across the wet grass to a remote sequestered corner the most important place in the grounds because it contained his garden there were two round beds stocked with a variety of plants in one there was a pretty little rose tree i paused to admire its lovely blossoms oh never mind that he said contemptuously that is only marianne's garden look this is mine after i had observed every flower and listened to a disquisition on every plant i was permitted to depart but first with great pomp he plucked a polyanthus and presented it to me as one conferring a prodigious favour i observed on the grass about his garden certain apparatus of sticks and corn and asked what they were traps for birds why do you catch them papa says they do harm and what do you do with them when you catch them different things sometimes i give them to the cat sometimes i cut them in pieces with my penknife but the next i mean to roast alive and why would you mean to do such a horrible thing for two reasons first to see how long it will live and then to see what it will taste like but don't you know it is extremely wicked to do such things remember the birds can feel as well as you and think how would you like it yourself oh that's nothing i'm not a bird and i can't feel what i do to them but you will have to feel it some time tom you have heard where wicked people go when they die and if you don't leave off torturing innocent birds remember you will have to go there and suffer just what you have made them suffer oh pooh i shan't papa knows how i treat them and he never blames me for it he says it is just what he used to do when he was a boy last summer he gave me a nest full of young sparrows and he saw me pulling off their legs and wings and heads and never said anything except that they were nasty things and i must not let them soil my trousers and uncle robson was there too and he laughed and said i was a fine boy but what would your mamma say oh she doesn't care she says it's a pity to kill the pretty singing birds but the naughty sparrows and mice and rats i may do what i like with so now miss gray you see it is not wicked i still think it is tom and perhaps your papa and mamma would think so too if they thought much about it however i internally added they may say what they please but i am determined you shall do nothing of the kind as long as i have power to prevent it he next took me across the lawn to see his mole traps and then into the stackyard to see his weasel traps one of which to his great joy contained a dead weasel and then into the stable to see not the fine carriage horses but a little rough colt which he informed me had been bred on purpose for him and he was to ride it as soon as it was properly trained i tried to amuse the little fellow and listened to all his chatter as complacently as i could for i thought that if he had any affections at all i would endeavour to win them and then in time i might be able to show him the error of his ways but i looked in vain for that generous noble spirit his mother talked of though i could see he was not without a certain degree of quickness and penetration when he chose to exert it when we re-entered the house it was nearly tea-time master tom told me that as papa was from home he and i and marianne were to have tea with mamma for a treat 
for on such occasions she always dined at luncheon time with them instead of at six o'clock soon after tea marianne went to bed but tom favoured us with his company and conversation till eight after he was gone mrs bloomfield further enlightened me on the subject of her children's dispositions and acquirements and on what they were to learn and how they were to be managed and cautioned me to mention their defects to no one but herself my mother had warned me before to mention them as little as possible to her for people did not like to be told of their children's faults and so i concluded i was to keep silence on them altogether about half-past nine mrs bloomfield invited me to partake of a frugal supper of cold meat and bread i was glad when that was over and she took her bedroom candlestick and retired to rest for though i wished to be pleased with her her company was extremely irksome to me and i could not help feeling that she was cold grave and forbidding the very opposite of the kind warm-hearted matron my hopes had depicted her to be End of chapter 2